Well, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. God's Word says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Verse 21, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, in love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with love incorruptible. Let's pray together. Father, as we bring this series to close, going through the book of Ephesians, Lord, we're grateful for how your word has spoken to us thus far. And the words that we're looking at today are extremely important for many of us in this room. Words maybe that in some cases we are familiar with, and in other cases maybe things that we need to be thinking about that we're not thinking about in our lives. But again, most important is for us to hear you for us to hear you speak. That's my prayer for each and every person here this morning, that they will hear you speak to their heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul uh, has uh, shifts into his final remarks in this book, this great book of Ephesians, by, by saying this. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Now Paul is continuing to reveal how we as followers of Jesus Christ, how, those, how we as those who receive salvation uh, through Jesus Christ, he's continuing to talk about how we can live our lives in a manner worthy of that great salvation that we have received from God. And in order to do this, we must hear this key word this morning. Here it is. It's this word. It's the word reliance. Say that word with me. Reliance. Say it again. Reliance. That is so important. If we're going to live our lives in a manner worthy of the Lord and our salvation that we've received from Him, we're going to have to learn how to be reliant on Him. Not self-reliant, but reliant on Jesus. We're commanded to be strong in the Lord. We're commanded to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Paul didn't say, be strong in yourself and the strength of your might for a very good reason. He didn't say that. He, He didn't say be strong in yourself. He said be strong in the Lord because apart from Him, you have no might and you have no strength to live the Christian life the way it is to be lived. Learning this is as important as as many other things I can think of in your own spiritual growth, in your own spiritual life. When you learn to be reliant on Him, 
when you learn to depend on him, when you learn to realize that, that you can't do it on your own, you can't do it in your own strength, in, in many ways that's, that's half the battle. And if you're going to live this way, if you're going to be strong in the Lord, there are, very few, there, there are a few important things, very important things that you must know. Now, I'm going to throw something on the screen here. Do you remember this? Can you see it? It's kind of, with the lights on, it's kind of hard to see. Have you ever been watching, watching NBC? You know, thank you. That helps out a little bit. Yeah. You know, and, and are, you, are you thinking like I'm thinking right now? Do you hear this in your head? Dun, 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 dun. The more you know, it's a public service uh, series from NBC, usually using celebrities from their television shows. And, and, and they'll just kind of pop up, you know, during a commercial break. And they'll, they'll give, they give the audience some, some helpful and important information uh, to ponder, to make your life better. Okay? So I want you to think about that this morning in the sense that today, God's Word is going to be giving you some very useful information that will help you to be strong in the Lord. And some of this information that, that, that God's Word is giving us here is so important. And you may not really understand how important it is. And so I think it's, it's good to be listening today to what God might say to you individually and to us collectively. How can we be strong in the Lord? Well, knowing these things will help you be strong in the Lord. First, know you are in a battle. Paul uses the word wrestle. No, he didn't say wrestle. He said wrestle. And he uses this word wrestle to illustrate that we as believers in Jesus Christ are in a battle. Now in the ancient world, the, the, the spectacle in the ancient world of wrestling it isn't really comparable to what you might think of when you think of wrestling today. Some of you are thinking about a high school wrestling match. Some of you are thinking about some Saturday night in a big arena with all kinds of, you know, gla glamour and, and all that. But in Paul's day, there was very little glamour attached to wrestling. In fact, you had two opponents, right? And here's how it worked out. If you won, you lived. If you lost, you died. That makes things pretty serious, doesn't, doesn't it? If you're in that wrestling match and you realize if I lose this wrestling match, I die, you're gonna be approaching that match with a pretty high degree of urgency, are you not? And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, we, 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 we're wrestling. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about who he says we're wrestling with. But there's a battle here. He says that the stakes could not be any higher for this battle. And if you don't acknowledge it, if you don't acknowledge that you're in a battle, you're in trouble. Now, I shared this with the Bible study group earlier. We were in the same passage. You know, I, through the years, I've noticed how people have, uh, uh, um, approach spiritual warfare. Uh, Christians, how Christians approach spiritual warfare. And some people see demons behind every rock. And, and they, they have this sense of everything that happens is, is, is something that's happening because of spiritual warfare. If you get a cold, it's the demon of, of influenza. Or if you get, you know, if something happens, it's, you know, and, and I think that's a, that's a dangerous approach to it. Because I think that puts too much emphasis on the demonic instead of on Christ himself. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But I think, and I shared with this group, I don't think very many of us are like that. I think more of us err on a different side that may be more dangerous. And the side we err on is we just don't really acknowledge the fact that there is a battle. And we're in trouble for it. Because we don't realize we're in a battle with spiritual forces. A spiritual battle that is real. And, and, and we, we're struggling with it. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, sooner or later... Every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. And that he faces an enemy who is much stronger than he is apart from the Lord. And so daily recognizing the battle that you're likely to be in is the first step to victory. Paul is being very careful here to point out how serious this battle is. 
Christians are not to take this battle lightly. You're not to take it lightly in your own life, spiritually, in the life of your family, in the life of your church, and so on and so on. We're to take this battle seriously. Think about those soldiers on the morning of June 6, 1944, who were going across the English Channel in those, those troop carriers, getting ready to land on the beaches of Normandy. Do you think they understood and knew that a real battle was awaiting them? Did they have to be convinced of the danger that was lurk lurking ahead? Absolutely not. They knew and they understood what they were in and what they were getting into. And you and I as believers in Jesus Christ need to understand that we are in a battle and the stakes are high. Yes, we're talking life and death stakes here. Certainly spiritually speaking. So first, you need to know that you're in a battle. But second, you need to know your enemy. Know your enemy. One of the reasons why we struggle in the battle is because we have either underestimated our enemy or we have misidentified our enemy. I think it's fair to say that as believers in Jesus Christ, the Bible reveals to us three enemies that we, we face. The Bible identifies for us the devil and his demonic forces as our enemy. Uh, the Bible also identifies the world as our enemy, meaning the, the world system that's under the control of Satan as being our enemy. But the Bible also identifies our own fleshly desires as our enemy. In other words, you can't always say the devil made me do it. It's your sin nature inside of you. Your wants and your wishes sometimes can also be your enemy. So the Bible identifies these as our enemies, but in today's passage, Paul is focusing on that first enemy. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he talks about those forces, those spiritual forces working alongside the devil. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers. He says, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Jesus often reminded his disciples to not take the devil lightly. And he, he often reminded his disciples that the devil was coming for them. Jesus would say to his disciples and to us today, don't underestimate the power of the enemy and don't try to fight him on your own. He's a serious enemy and he's stronger than you. Way stronger than you. But also, don't miss identify the enemy. The enemy is not flesh and blood here. That's what Paul says. Let me put it this way. Your wife is not the enemy. Your husband is not the enemy. Even if it feels like it. Both ways. Your children are not the enemy. Even though it may feel like it sometimes. Your fellow church member is not the enemy. And I've seen that play out time after time after time. And I just want to look at two people and say, don't you realize it? You're not the enemy of each other. But you're acting like it. And, and even the worst people in the world, I mean the people who are literally aggressively, violently persecuting the church, even those people are not the ultimate enemy. And we misidentify the enemy when we see it that way. Listen, think about it this way. Never, ever, ever will you read in the Bible where God says to you, his people, forgive the devil. Look for it. It ain't there. God doesn't want you to make peace with that enemy. Ever. 
But God does say forgive other people, right? He says love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. You see, who's the real enemy? Satan is the real enemy. Not flesh and blood. And sometimes we misidentify the enemy. This is what we do. We, we're tempted to make peace with Satan and to war with other people. We do it all the time. We make peace with Satan when we go to war with other people. And I can promise you, believer, when you go to war with another believer, Satan loves it. You're making peace with Satan when you do that. That's what we're tempted to do because we don't understand who our true enemy is. Know your enemy. Know what he's capable of. Know who he really is. Not flesh and blood, but devil and the demonic forces that oppose God in this world. But also, if you're going to be strong in the Lord, if you're going to be a good soldier, you must know your surroundings. Listen, every good soldier takes care to observe and to gain knowledge about the terrain where the battle is to be fought. You would do well to, to do the same. Know your surroundings. Notice what Paul says here. He says, in talking about our enemy, he says, uh, they are the cosmic powers over this present darkness. And earlier in, in Ephesians, he said this in chapter 5, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are, the, are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. The times are evil. And then the Apostle John says this in 1 John chapter 2. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Think about it this way. The soldier doesn't want to live on the battlefield. That's not where the soldier wants to live. The soldier, for the soldier, the battlefield is the place where they can fight so that they can go home. They never see the battlefield as home. They see it the place where they're doing battle so that they can go home. This earth is our battlefield, but it's not our home. And this earth is a dark and evil place. Don't fall in love with it. Know where you are. Know your surroundings. You know, I was kind of rebuking those who see demons behind every rock, but the reality is evil is everywhere. This is a dark place and it's not your home. And as soon as you embrace this earth and love the things of this earth, you're in trouble because you're not aware of your surroundings. And you're not aware that your surroundings will kill you. If you're not careful, they'll choke your surroundings will choke the spiritual life out of you. If you're not careful, know your surroundings, but also know your job. Listen, Paul wants you to see yourself as a soldier in a battle, but soldiers have different roles on the battlefield and knowing your role or your job is vitally important. Notice this. Notice what Paul keeps saying that we are to do. There's a, there's a word that keeps popping up. He says, we're to put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He goes on, he says, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Oh, and by the way, stand, therefore. <laughs> you, you see a common... A common theme there? Stand, stand, stand. That's your job. The, the New American Standard uh, Bible uh, um, translates it this way, that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Resist and stand. Resist and stand. That's your job. Now the old hardened veteran soldier is likely to take the new green recruit aside and, and say, don't try to be a hero. Somebody who's been in battle and who's been in many battles will say to the green recruits, 
Listen, don't try to be a hero. If you try to be a hero, you're going to get yourself killed or you're going to get somebody else around you killed. Don't try to be a hero. The, the soldier who wants glory, and he was saying, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, I'm going to win the day all by myself. He's going to get themselves killed or get someone else killed. Listen, if we're, we're fighting the battle to gain some glory for ourselves or or if our notion of the, of the battle is to, is to be leading the wild and bold charge all by ourselves into the fire of the enemy, we might be setting ourselves up for tragic defeat. Listen, let me put it this way. Don't try to do Jesus' job in the battle. That's his job. His job was accomplished when he died on the cross. And he rose from the grave. You can't do that. That's not your job. Listen, do your job. Your job is to resist and to stand. James 4, 7 says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Please hear that part of this verse. Submit yourselves therefore to God. The most important part of this verse is there. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, this resistance is not passive, but you don't have to conquer the field. Jesus has already done that. Your role is to stand on the solid ground that Jesus has already won for you. Stand your ground. He has won the battle. He has taken care of the enemy. Don't try to do his job. Just stand and resist when the attacks come. Know your job. But another thing you need to know is you need to know your weapons. And here's that familiar sec section of Scripture that RJ did such a great job talking to the kids about this morning. This, uh, these weapons, this familiar list that Paul provides that honestly often gets the most attention in this larger section of Scripture. And maybe that's not the best thing sometimes because there's some stuff before this and stuff after this that we need to be talking about, not just this list of, of armor or weapons. But understand this. The armor listed here is already yours. Paul is not saying that you need to go out and get these things. He's saying these things are already available to you because of what Christ has done. These things are available to you because of the gospel, because of what Christ accomplished when he died on the cross and rose from the grave, and because you've placed your faith and trust in him, and you belong to him. The, the armor or the weapons that are listed here are already available to you because of your salvation. And the idea here is not something that you continuously put on and take off, put on and take off. You know, I was talking to the group earlier you know, the, the, the soldier during peacetime probably isn't going to wear all the armor all the time because he doesn't need to wear the armor. He doesn't need all the weapons. But when it's, when it's battle time, guess what? He's going to be armored up. He's going to be suited up. And he's going to have all the weapons ready and available to him. And he's going to be wearing them. But here's the thing. There's never a time for you to rest from this battle. In other words, the only time you can actually take the armor off is the time that comes when you die or the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Because until that time, you're in the battle. And you're never out of it. So the idea here isn't, well, you're going to put some of this on and, and, and go to battle and then take it off when, you know, in between battles. No, you're always wearing the armor. You put it on, you keep it on. That's the idea here. And I'm going to say just a few words here, very quick words about each part of this armor that, that Paul mentions. He mentions the belt of truth. Now, let's talk about that. Truth. What, what truth do we need to put around us and, and keep around us on a consistent basis? It's the truth of your identity in Christ. Who you are in Christ and knowing the truth about who you are in Christ will make all the difference in the battle. Knowing that you belong to Jesus. Knowing that you are a child of God because you've been born again. Knowing that you've been adopted into his family. Knowing that you're, you among others are brothers and sisters in Christ. Knowing who you are in relation to God, in relation to Christ, in relation to other believers makes all the difference in the battle. The truth here 
is who you are in Christ, your identity in Him. And Satan will attack you on this point. He'll cause you to question and wonder if you really belong to God. He'll cause you to question and wonder if, if maybe you're being the good Christian you're supposed to be. But the reality is you could be maybe a better Christian, but you're still never going to lose who you are in Christ. <laughs> you belong to Him. That's the truth. The truth is who you are in Christ, your identity in Christ. He says the breastplate of righteousness. We were talking about this earlier. You know, this wasn't the case in World War II, but the modern day soldier in some ways is, is dressed very similar to the ancient soldier because the modern day soldier now has the body armor on, right? And that's what Paul's talking about. It's the, it's, it's the ancient body armor that covered the soldier from like the neck to the waist and covered the vital organs, just like the body armor that a soldier has on him today that protects him from, from bullets or whatever that might hit him. And, and, the, and the idea is here, you might get hit, but maybe you won't get hit in an area that'll kill you if you've got on the, the body armor. But that's what the image is here. It's the breastplate of righteousness, protecting those vital organs. And, and righteousness means both righteous living on your part, meaning you, do, you live the way God wants you to live. You, you do what he says do, and you don't do what he says don't do, so that you do not give the devil a foothold where he can attack and hold on in your life. And so it's both that righteousness, but it's also the righteousness of Christ that is counted on your behalf. In other words, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your good works, he sees Christ's work on the cross on your behalf. Christ's righteousness is counted to your credit. That's the breastplate of righteousness. Then he says, as shoes for your feet, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And many of us sometimes when we read this, we think, oh, he's talking about how we need to be go out there sharing the gospel everywhere. And of course, we should be going out there sharing the gospel everywhere. But I don't think that's what he means here. I think what he means here is the idea of peace coming from the gospel. It's interesting that he uses that word peace in the middle of a combat warfare setting. And we've already talked about how God never wants you to make peace with the enemy here with Satan and, and the demonic forces. You're never to make peace with them. But the idea here is because of the gospel, because you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel, you can have peace with God. And I can promise you this, you don't want to fight the enemy if things aren't well with you and God. <laughs> You need to be ready for battle, and you're ready for battle when you're at peace with God. That's important. The readiness given by the gospel of peace. And he says, he says also part of the armor is the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The, the, the devil will attack often with temptations. And every temptation of the devil is either directly or indirectly for the purpose of causing you to doubt or disbelieve God. Every temptation of the devil is, to, is for the purpose of getting you to doubt or disbelieve God. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you'll see that. Did God really say, that was Satan's attack, his temptation was, you know, I think, I'm not sure you really understand what God is saying, or maybe, maybe God's not as great as he says he is. Every temptation you face in, in one way or the other is for that purpose. And Paul says we're to take up the shield of faith which, with, with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, all these temptations that are going to come our way. Think about shields with a minute. We, again, the shield he's talking about is not the one you hold in one hand and kind of you've got the sword in the other and you're kind of going to battle like this. The shield he's talking about is the full body shield. If you, if you look at in uh, ancient warfare, you'll, you, maybe you'll see pictures of this. I was sharing earlier, if you watch the movie Gladiator, at the, that really epic scene, battle scene at the very beginning of the movie Gladiator with the, the Romans versus the, the barbarians, you see them using these full body shields. And the interesting thing about these full body shields is they were not designed just to protect the one individual, but when put together, they could protect an entire group of individuals. Do you hear something there? These shields, the shield of faith connected with other shields of faith makes you stronger. 
In other words, the body of Christ, the church. You're stronger when you're going to battle with others. Paul's faith makes me stronger. My faith makes Paul's faith stronger. You see what we're saying? The shield of faith. Not just, these were not just meant to be used individually, but as groups together. They offered great protection against those arrows that were coming, those temptations. And he says, also, we should have the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Think about it this way. Your salvation means, I mean, the salvation that you've received means that no matter how bad the battle is, it's not always going to have, go on. There will be a day when the battle ends. And you already know, while you're in battle, that you're on the winning side. <laughs> Doubting whether or not you can win or not is a dangerous place to be in the battle. The helmet of salvation, thinking and understanding your salvation means you know what, what the future holds. And you know how the battle's ultimately going to end. Understanding and knowing that no matter how bad things get here, this is not our home. We will go home. Think about a soldier who thinks, I'll never get to go home. That's a discouraged soldier. But a soldier who's fighting to go home is a much stronger soldier. You'll go home no matter what happens in the battle here on earth. The helmet of salvation helps us to understand the great hope of our final salvation and gives us confidence and assurance in the battle today. And then, of course, as RJ did such a great job this morning, he says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just as RJ was talking about, when, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, each one of Satan's temptations, Jesus answered specifically with God's word. His, his answers came, were specific to the temptation coming from Satan. The sword here is not that Paul is talking about. I mean, literally the word that is used here is not for the, the big, long, broad sword. You know, like your Lord of the Rings epic battle with the big, long swords that I look at sometimes and think, I don't even think I could pick that up, you know, watching, you know, watching them sling it. It's, it's the stabbing sword. It was a smaller sword and it was used in a much more precise way than the broad sword. Well, God's word is like that, right? Just as Jesus demonstrated, when Satan attacks you, you attack him specifically with God's word that addresses that specific attack that Satan has given. That's why it is so important for you to know God's word. You never know what part of God's word you're going to need in any given moment. If you only know a few verses, that's great. That's better than some. But if, you, if, you, if you've immersed yourself in this entire book, you're going to have a wealth of resources available to you when the enemy attacks. Studying God's Word, reading it, studying it, learning it with other believers, memorizing it, meditating on it, all these things will help you to be more effective in the battle, to take up the sword of the Spirit, which of course is the Word of God. Know your weapons. Know your weapons. We could go and talk so much more about that. But next, you need to know your strategy. And your strategy is prayer. This is your strategy. Paul says this, praying at all times in the Spirit. He is just continuing his thought about the armor of God. He never even ends the sentence. He's talking about putting on the armor of God and then he just continues the thought with this phrase, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. The idea is you're wearing the armor in order to pray. <laughs> you're wearing the armor because the battle is the praying. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Listen, soldiers must pray know both their job and their battle plan. And often we struggle because we live as if we're ignorant of, of, of the job and ne neglectful of the battle plan. Your strategy in the battle, and in many ways the battle itself, is prayer. 
You are not a spiritual warrior if you're not praying. Not at all. You are easy pickings for the enemy if you're not praying. Prayer is your rules for engagement and it's the strategy for victory. And far too many of us are soldiers wandering around on the battlefield trying to figure out what to do. Pray. That's what to do. If the enemy is attacking, pray. If all is quiet on the battlefield, pray. If you feel like you're in a vulnerable position, pray. If you feel safe and secure, pray. <laughs> Paul is saying it simply. We are to be praying at all times. At all times. When things are good, when things are bad, when things are in between. At all times, we are to be praying. That's our strategy. Pray. Pray. You've got all this armor available to you. And you're not using it. Because you're not praying. <laughs> and not only is prayer where you fight the battle, but much more important than that, prayer is where you get to know Jesus. And that brings us to that last thing that you must know. You must know your commander. Know your commander. If you're going to be strong in the Lord, if you're going to be a spiritual warrior worthy of the fight, you've got to know your commander. Now, I want you to think with me a little bit about your commander this morning. Your commander has already won the battle. When he was on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It is accomplished. He's already won the battle. Your commander has defeated your enemy. The very first um, prophecy of Jesus Christ in all of Scripture is Genesis chapter 3. Right after the fall in the garden, God is saying this to Satan. He says to Satan, he will crush your head. Who is God talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Your commander did that. He beat the enemy. It's a good thing I wore my boots this morning. Your commander has overcome the world, your surroundings. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Your commander stood against Satan's temptations. While he was on this earth, he stood his ground in the wilderness when Satan was tempting him. He stood his ground in the Garden of Gethsemane when Satan was tempting him to, to shriek away from the cross. He has stood his ground. Your commander did that. Your commander is the embodiment of all your weapons. Your commander is the truth. Your commander is your righteousness. Your commander is your peace. Your commander is the object or the person of your faith. Your commander is your salvation. Your commander is the Word of God. And by the way, it is through prayer, as I said a minute ago, that you come to know your commander. Listen, the battle is not about you. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. And many of us as Christians are wimpy, wimpy, wimpy Christians. Because we're making it all about us. Why is this happening to me? Why am I not happier in my marriage? Why are my kids so unruly? Why am I tired all the time? I'm sorry, ladies. I probably shouldn't have thrown that last one in. Because we make the battle about us. It's about what's happening to us. But this battle is so much bigger than us. It's about Him. 
And the number one reason why you need to be fighting this battle is not so your life will be better. It's for Him. It's for His glory. And it's for His kingdom. Quit making it about you. If you make it about you, you're going to be a whiny baby all the time. And you can get mad at God because something bad happened to you. How dare something bad happen to you? You're in a battle. And it's not about you, it's about your commander. The battle is not yours to win, it's his. Stay close to Jesus. And as important as it is to know who the enemy is and to know what the enemy is capable of, it is infinitely more important to know Jesus Christ, your great commander, and to be close to him and to know and to understand what he and only he can, will do, what he will do on your behalf and what he will do for his glory and for the good of his kingdom. Know your commander. Know Jesus. Be close to Jesus. If you take care of number seven, all the others will fall into place. Know Jesus. Listen, you're in a battle, but you're not alone. You've got us. But if I were you, I'd look around and say, good, <laughs> great, thanks. It's good to know I got you guys. But more importantly, you've got Christ at your side. Jesus will never ask you to do anything that he hasn't already done. And there are some things that you can't do that only he can do. And the things that he wants you to do in the battle, he'll take care of that if you trust him and you rely on him. Because it's not in your power. Paul started this whole section of scripture by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's your assurance in this battle. You got to know you're in a battle. But once you realize you're in a battle and you get serious about fighting this battle, understand and know that his power is enough to completely destroy the enemy day after day after day in your life. It's important to know these things. It's important to know Jesus. Let's pray together.